There are many different subtypes of multiple sclerosis, relapsing remitting MS, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS, clinically isolated syndrome, and many more. What do all these terms mean? I'm going to explain it all today. Let's have some fun. My name is Brandon Bieber and I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications and if you find this video informative please click like. Now to really understand the subtypes you have to understand the concepts of a relapse and of progression. Basically there are two ways to get worse with multiple sclerosis. The first is a relapse which is a relatively rapid change in symptoms due to new inflammation in the nervous system. And I use the terms relapse, flare, exacerbation, and attack interchangeably. Some use them in slightly different ways. But basically this is a new symptom that develops usually over days to weeks peaks and then may improve either spontaneously or with treatment, for instance with oral or intravenous steroid treatment. So to give an example, let's say I have pain in my right eye and then after a few days I start developing central vision loss and color changes and then it worsens to the point where I have significant loss of vision in my right eye and then maybe it slowly improves over several weeks and doesn't get back to normal because I still note a slight difference in color in my right eye but it's n almost normal. This would be optic neuritis and I do have a separate video on this if you want to take a look which is a common relapse in multiple sclerosis and recovery from relapses is highly variable. Some people improve rapidly within a few days. Some people have incomplete recovery and are left with some problems and some people have very poor recovery from a relapse and have significant problems. Now the other way that people can get worse with multiple sclerosis is called progression which is a slow and insidious decline in symptoms over time, often over months or many years and is often recognized retrospectively because it's so subtle. Now the most common symptom people notice would be progressive weakness of the legs and a decline in walking ability, although any symptom of MS can be affected by progressive MS, for instance progressive clumsiness or progressive cognitive symptoms. For example, a typical description would be, you know doctor, in the last few years I've had trouble keeping up with my wife, I'm walking slower and slower, and now particularly on a hot day I can really only walk a few blocks before I have to rest. That is a typical description in progressive of multiple sclerosis. Now I'm going to talk about the different subtypes as though they are truly distinct diseases but there's actually very strong evidence that all forms of multiple sclerosis are caused by the same underlying disease. For instance there's evidence from similar MRI findings, spinal tap findings, epidemiologic, genetic and risk factor similarities that these are really all the same disease with different manifestations in different people. For unknown reasons younger people with MS are more likely to have relapses and older people with MS are more likely to have progression, although these can certainly overlap. Now the most common type of MS at the time of diagnosis is relapsing remitting MS, and this is a form where people have distinct relapses or attacks as I described earlier, but between attacks they often have remission, and this doesn't necessarily mean that they have no symptoms of MS whatsoever, they may still have symptoms, but they're not having any new or active flares, and people can go months or even many years without having relapses, and they can be extremely stable and the degree of recovery from relapses is highly variable However, between relapses, people generally are not complaining of worsening symptoms. They usually describe themselves as stable. Now, unfortunately, recent evidence shows that people can have a very slight and unrecognized progression between relapses known as PIRA, or progression independent of relapse activity, and I do have a separate video on that if you want to take a look. Now, some people with relapsing remitting MS as they get older are very stable, but others, after years or decades, start noticing a progression progressive decline in symptoms, and this is known as a transition to secondary progressive MS, or SPMS. And it's considered secondary because the first form of MS was relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, and now this is the second form of MS in this particular individual. And often people have less or no relapses as they develop secondary progressive MS, but some people can continue to have relapses and make new lesions on the MRI.
And in real life, the transition often occurs gradually with relapses becoming less frequent and less severe and the progression being more and more noticeable over time. Now, some people develop progressive MS without ever having had a relapse beforehand. For instance, the first symptoms of MS could be progressive difficulty walking, and then they could have an MRI or spinal tap and be diagnosed with MS. And this form of progressive onset MS is known as primary progressive MS or PPMS. And it's primary because the first form of MS is progressive. Now some people with primary progressive MS never have a relapse in their entire lives, but some people do and there are all kinds of variations of it. For instance, in progressive relapsing MS, PRMS, people start with progressive progression, but they still have relapses. And some people have relapsing progressive MS, RPMS, where they have a relapse and shortly afterwards develop progressive MS. And some people have what's known as single attack progressive MS, where they sort of start with a relapse and immediately after develop progressive MS. And again, these are all forms of the exact same disease. Now you may also hear a term that modifies the subtypes of MS called active or not active. And people with progressive MS, some can make new lesions and have clinical relapses while others don't. And so if you don't have new relapses and you don't make new MRI lesions, you're considered not active. Whereas if you do, you're considered active. And this may have some clinical relevance because if there is disease activity or inflammatory disease activity, that suggests that the treatment is not working. And certain medications only have an FDA or EMA indication for progressive MS with activity. So for instance, a lot of drugs approved in the United States that are FDA approved have on the label approved for secondary progressive MS with activity. Now to switch gears a little bit, some people have a single event of inflammation in the central nervous system but do not actually meet the diagnostic criteria for multiple sclerosis. And this is known as CIS or clinically isolated syndrome. An example would be if you have optic neuritis but you don't meet the diagnostic criteria for MS. Now I'm not going to get into the technical details, but due to changes in the diagnostic criteria and advances in MRI, fewer and fewer people actually have CIS. A lot of the people historically who had CIS would now be considered to have multiple sclerosis. But the reason it's an important term is because there's evidence that people with CIS, if treated early with disease modifying therapy instead of waiting until the diagnosis with MS, actually do better in the long run on average. Now, uh, just to give an example, people with optic neuritis, in a famous study called the Optic Neuritis Treatment Trial, it was found that the best predictor of whether or not someone with CIS would go on to develop MS was the number of lesions in the brain that resemble MS. For instance, if you had an absolutely normal MRI with no lesions, the risk was only 25% at 15 years. If you had one to two lesions, the risk was about 68% at 15 years. And if you had three or more lesions, it was 78%. Although this was an older MRI study with lower Tesla strength, so I wouldn't take the data here too seriously. Now, believe it or not, some people can have MRI findings that look like MS without actually having symptoms of MS. For instance, someone could have a head injury or they could have migraines and they could get an MRI and surprise, surprise, the MRI looks like multiple sclerosis but they don't have any symptoms, and if you examine them, they don't have any exam findings of central nervous system injury. So of course, they don't meet the diagnostic criteria for MS, but it turns out they're at risk of developing MS in the future, and some develop it while others do not. And the biggest predictor about whether or not someone with RIS will develop MS is the presence of spinal cord lesions. So an MRI of the spine is often recommended, and the findings of a spinal tap may also be somewhat predictive based on some studies. Studies. The risk of MS is variable depending on the study, but one study found the risk is around 34% after five years. Of course, it depends on who you're scanning and what the lesions look like and whether or not the patient could have subtle unrecognized symptoms, so I wouldn't make too much of that number. Generally speaking, most doctors recommend not treating RIS with medications, but monitoring RIS. And of course, it could vary a little bit because some people with RIS actually have active lesions. Now, some subtypes of MS are related to the severity of the disease, and you may hear the term benign multiple sclerosis, which is essentially very mild multiple sclerosis. Some people with MS, even with no treatment, after many, many years and decades, could be doing extremely well. They may have relapses, but they would have infrequent and mild relapses from which they recover, 
and never develop progressive MS. And I have certainly seen many cases like this in my career. Now the problem is that it's very difficult to define. In clinical trials, sometimes people will define benign MS as having an EDSS less than or equal to 3 after 15 to 20 years. And EDSS is Expanded Dis Disability Status Scale, which is a measure of MS disability used in MS research. And I have a separate video on it if you want to take a look. And an EDSS of 3 could be considered mild to moderate disability. But the problem is, one, some people with an EDSS of 2 to 3 could still have significant symptoms of MS, and it could actually be significantly disabling or decrease the quality of life. And also, even if you have an EDSS of 2 or 3 after 20 years, that doesn't necessarily mean you will continue to have benign MS for the next 20 to 30 years. That being said, even though it's a little bit of an obtuse concept, I certainly have seen people with very mild MS even after many decades despite no treatment, and I ask every single one of these patients about their diet and lifestyle, no obvious patterns so far. Many admit to no specific diet and sometimes a relatively poor diet. There's a related term called burnt out multiple sclerosis, which is a form of MS that could be moderate or severe over many years, and people could acquire moderate or significant disability from it, but as they get older, it may sort of stop, and they may not have further relapses and not have any MS progression, at least none that is clinically obvious and they refer to this as sort of burnt out MS because it's kind of like there was a forest fire and there's some damage to the trees but nothing really active happening at this time. Now sometimes MS can be very aggressive and fulminant with many active lesions and rapidly worsening symptoms known as rapidly worsening multiple sclerosis and this can be very aggressive and lead to permanent disability quickly and is often treated aggressively with potent immunotherapy and it can also occur in children or teenagers and in that case it could be referred to as Schilder's disease or diffuse myeloclastic sclerosis which is really probably just a variant of multiple sclerosis. Now sometimes MS can actually cause a single massive lesion in one area of the brain that could easily be mistaken for a brain tumor and this is known as tumefactive multiple sclerosis and often we won't even know the diagnosis so we'll have a neurosurgeon biopsy the lesion and only when the pathology comes back as inflammation rather than tumor cells will we know the diagnosis. Sometimes the large mass can occur in isolation and sometimes there could be other lesions more typical of multiple sclerosis. And in some cases the lesion could have this unusual ring-like appearance where there's abnormal inflamed tissue but spared tissue in between and cause an onion skinning like appearance and this is known as Baylor's concentric sclerosis but also a form of MS. Now there are many other diseases that could mimic multiple sclerosis and I have a separate video on that with some of their MRI findings if you want to take a look but what I want to mention a few diseases that historically were thought to be subtypes of MS but we now know them to be distinct diseases. The most notable is neuromyelitis optica or NMO and this is an autoimmune disorder that typically attacks the spinal cord and optic nerves but can also attack the brain and it actually is associated with an abnormal antibody called anti aquaporin 4 or in rare cases anti-MOG and historically it was called DeVic disease and it was thought to be an optico-spinal subtype of multiple sclerosis but now we know it's a totally different disease and different treatments which may actually help MS could make NMO worse. Another disease which fortunately is very rare is a disease called Western Hurst Syndrome which is diffused inflammation of the brain associated with bleeding or hemorrhages. The MRI image you're looking at shows dephasing in dark areas and you can see in the cerebrum and midbrain that is bleeding associated with the inflammation. Luckily this is extremely rare. I'm not sure I've even seen a single case in my career. The next disease I want to mention is ADEM or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. This is inflammation of the brain and sometimes the spinal cord that usually occurs after a stimulus to the immune system, but sometimes it can occur spontaneously. So often there's a history of an illness such as an upper respiratory tract infection or a diarrheal illness, or sometimes it could occur after a vaccine and it causes, as I said, inflammation of the brain and spine that is usually very diffuse and patchy, but often responds well to steroids and people tend to get better and usually do not develop a chronic disease, though there are rare cases of recurrent ADEM or people who have ADEM who later develop multiple sclerosis. Now ADEM is much more common in children. It's rare in adults, although I have seen a few cases.
The last disease I want to talk about is Sussac's disease, which is a rare autoimmune disease that affects the blood vessels in the brain. Now, it also affects young women just like MS, but in MS, the average age of onset is 30, but in Sussac's disease, it's even younger, around like 18 years old. And what's unique about Sussac's disease is it can cause these strange lesions that are described as snowball lesions in the corpus callosum. You're looking at a T1 image where you can see these round, dark snowballs. Also, Sussac's disease affects the blood vessels of the ears and eyes, and you can get retinal vasculitis, causing vision loss and hearing loss, which would be relatively rare in MS, although it could occur in MS. But anyways, Sussex disease usually responds to immunotherapy and is not necessarily a chronic disease. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Did I miss any subtypes? Do you have any questions about any of these subtypes? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?